Y'all you know what rained this morning? Let me all say, huh? <laughs> Way before daylight this morning, it comes shower rain. Y'all say, uh-uh. He tell them many stories. Say, y'all wasn't up, you don't know. <laughs> I was up, I know. It come a shower of rain this morning about 5 o'clock, a little after 5. So the Lord just, he gave us a little rain this morning, and he also gave us some beautiful sunshine and some great temperatures out there. See, he's a God that always provides exactly what we need. He always provides. And we're glad you're here this morning. And uh, just be much in prayer for this month coming up. Uh, May and June is busy. But let's not ever, ever, ever lose sight of what we're busy for. Not for the church, not for each other. We're busy for the Lord Jesus. And that everything that's in our schedule coming up magnifies and glorifies the name of the Lord. And let's don't lose track of that. Let's don't lose sight of that as we move into this busy time. Uh, thank you so much for just being here today. Thank you for getting up this morning. And, and making the effort to be here. And Because I'm telling you, God creates that desire in us. And he... We want to be with God's people. We want to be in the house of the Lord. So we're glad you're here today. And the Lord's going to touch and move in the life today. I just feel it today. So let's pray together and just ask God just to anoint the service. Father God in heaven, we love you. And Father, we thank you so much for being just a great and awesome God. Lord, we thank you so much, Father, for just being here with us already in our Sunday school this morning, God. Lord, we just pray, God, that as we move into this worship hour, Father, we just ask for an anointing from above. Father, you so richly blessed us with a desire to be here today, Father. We just pray, God, that you just rain down now from heaven on us today, Lord, and just let everything here, Lord, just magnify you, Father. We lift up all those that's been mentioned on the prayer list this morning, God. We just pray, God, you continue to work in their lives, Lord. But at this time, Father, we just pray for the ones that are here, Lord, as the word comes this morning. I just pray, God, that you reach and touch a heart, Father. Lord, we love you and we thank you, Lord. We thank you, pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Number 
Randy an extra five minutes if we didn't do something. And he knows to take it. I got so. pages and notes. <laughs> uh, there's just some things from some folks' lives. I, everybody turn to 3.30. 3.30 in this book, please. And uh, I'm going to ask the question. All the verses are questions, okay? But down on the chorus, is the answer. We've done this before. So when you get down to that answer on the chorus, 
I want you to sing it like you mean it, okay? But listen to uh, the words here.
a lot of times we wonder about that, don't we? A lot of times in our life we wonder when we go through struggles and troubles, trials and, and things. We wonder, does he really care? Why would he allow me to go through this? Why, why, would this, why is this in my life right now? He cares about everything in your life right now. Yeah. Because he wants the glory out of everything in your life. Even the hard times, the troubled times. Uh, and I know many of you have asked me this morning about uh, the Turner family, what we can do to help them. It's coming whenever we get them kind of situated somewhere. Then we will address the needs that we're going to have to help them with there. So, and thank you on their behalf for the, the uh, quick response. Friday, one of those unseen things, one of those things you didn't know were coming, but you guys turned out and, and we helped them get some stuff situated and settled that, e that, that evening. So thank you for that quick response. You know, everything in the gospel Listen to this, it's, the, it's probably not going to make sense to some of you. It's a quick response. Move quickly. Just move quickly. You sit and think too long, and you'll find up every reason in the world not to respond. When Jesus met the woman at the well and told her everything in her life, when it was time for her to go, she left that water pot and she went in the direction that Jesus sent her without anything to hinder her. So sometimes you just got to leave that water pot and go. Whatever's going on in your life, just leave that thing there and go. This morning, as you turn with me to the 15th chapter of the book of Acts, I did everything I could to skip over this. Y'all ever done that? I, this has really got, you know, it's not really, Lord, what I want to preach. It's not what I want to share. It's not what, at least you hear what I'm saying, what I want to share, what I want to preach. And God says, I've got a purpose for this. If I had not had a purpose for it, I wouldn't have put it in here, okay? So back up, look at it, read it. I want to show you some things out here. I want to help you this morning because somebody here may need some help this morning understanding the salvation of a holy God. Did you know what we do when it comes to salvation? We do exactly what takes place in this chapter, in this 15th chapter of Acts right here. We try to put so many stipulations on it sometimes that we make it so complicated that people don't understand it. We want it to be in our terms, our way, make it look like we want it to look. But salvation is pure and simple. It's through the blood of Christ. There's no other way. There's nothing you can add to it. There's nothing you can take away from it. Salvation is simple. It's the, the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary and the resurrection that we celebrated that third day that gives us freedom from our sin. Not nothing I'm going to do, not nothing you're going to do, except respond. Except respond. But as... Paul and Barnabas made their way back to Antioch, and they were, as we learned in that latter part of the 14th chapter, they were just spending some time there, working there with the folks there, working with the disciples there. The scripture is going to teach us something that just always understand this. They'd been through a troubled time. We saw in that 13th, 14th chapter, we saw things they'd went through on that first missionary journey. And when they made it back, I always remember this. When God does something good, Trouble's not far behind because the devil can't stand it when God's being glorified. He can't stand it when the church is glorifying God. He can't stand it when your life is glorifying God. He can't stand it when everything that you attribute in your life is glorifying God. The devil can't stand it. So I'm guarantee you, trouble's going to come. He's going to send it. In this first part of this 15th chapter, in these first five verses, look at what it says right here. It says, And certain men... You see that? And certain men, which came down from, the, from, from Judea, taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and, and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem up to the, unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through 
Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and, the, and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all the things that God had done with them. But there rose up a certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that this is needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, when you see that right there, God had done a work, man. They had been on that missionary journey. They had shared the gospel of grace all the way through those places. And God had did an absolute work right there. We saw the ones that had come to know Christ. All of a sudden, here comes a sect of men. And I want you to understand something. They come in and say, we've got to get back to the law of Moses. We've got to get back, listen to this, to the things of men before salvation can take place. Well, I want you to understand something. I can't save nobody. And ain't nothing on me or in me except Jesus Christ that can save anybody. So don't look at me and say, hey, you've got to be like him to be saved. That's not true. You've got to be who Christ wants you to be in salvation, not like anybody else, okay? So if we put stipulations on salvation to say you've got to go through this to do it, to, to be saved, we're, de we're, we're tainting the gospel. And we don't want to do that. We can't do that, church, because it gets tainted enough now by the world so the church can't taint it. And it says this, here comes trouble. Certain men, they were associated with the church in Jerusalem, but they were not authorized by the church in Jerusalem to come to this place. They were associated with them, but the church didn't send them. They didn't step up and say, hey, go down there to Antioch. Get them boys. They got it all messed up down there. Y'all ever somebody do that to you, come to you and say, hey, you've got it all messed up. You're going to have to fix what you've got going on. So they get down there. Now, they're going to argue. The last person in the world I want to argue with is Paul. I mean, I would not want to come and argue with this intellectual man that had been saved by the grace of a holy God that knew the laws better than they did, but knew what God could do in a life outside the law. I wouldn't want to stand there and toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. But they chose to. They came in and they said, man, we think you need to go up to Jerusalem and explain yourself to the church. Because I'm telling you, without circumcision, without something of the flesh, man cannot be saved. I'm going to tell you something. There ain't nothing in the flesh that can save a man. But that's already been proven. What happens when the flesh gets involved, when the flesh got involved with Adam, sin crept into the world? So how in the world would we come to the note to say that flesh can save something? But in their mind, they said, this has got to happen. It was an attempt to mix the law and grace. And I'm going to tell you something. You cannot mix the law and grace. They complement each other. The law gives us a rule that, to, that we're supposed to live by. The grace is that forgiveness that comes when we break the rules because nobody can live perfectly by the law. And there was nothing in the law that could save anybody. It had to come through grace. And Paul had to make these guys understand that. They didn't want to understand it. I want you to understand something this morning. If there's anybody sitting here this morning that says, I'm saved by my good works, you're wrong. Because nothing in the flesh can save you. It's by the grace of the Holy God and the Holy Spirit working in your life. That's where salvation comes from. So they sit here and they make this great attempt to mix that law and grace. They were attempting, listen to this. Jesus said it best. They were attempting to pour new wine into old bottles. And if Jesus said, you can't do that. If you pour new wine into old bottles, it'll bust the bottles. You got to pour new wine in new bottles. When you become saved, when God saves you, when God speaks into your life, he doesn't go pour the old things of your life back into your life. He pours new things into your life. He poured new things into the life of these people that, that, that had come under the grace. As you sit here today and you say, well, I, you know, I don't understand all that. What happened was when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, there was a veil. Y'all remember that, Luke, chapter 24? That veil? And, and, when, and when Jesus died, when he finally gave up that ghost, when he finally had all he could stand in the flesh and took all the sin of the world on him, took every sin there was that would ever would be on himself, and that veil rent from the top to the bottom that no man could tear, what they're doing right here is making a, a, an attempt to stitch that veil back up. We've got to put something back between this holy 
God and man. We've got to put something back between there so that we can have control. Because if we've got that veil, then they can't see Jesus. I'm telling you something. They were making a very feeble attempt to stitch that veil up. And they were trying to sew it back up from the bottom to the top. They can't sew that veil back up because Jesus rent that veil. And he rent that veil so that we could know freedom in our salvation. They wanted to block the road. They wanted to put a wall up. They wanted to put a wall up between the Jew and the Gentile. A wall that had been there for so many years. A wall that God had given. He gave the law for a reason. So that the Jews wouldn't fall into the ways of the Gentile. He gave them the rules to live by. But they got so tainted over the years. And man had added to them over the years and years and years. They came to a point there was no way that a man could live under the law. So grace had to come. They were trying to build that wall back up. Old had to give way to new. Old had to give way to new. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated it for us through the veil that they say his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in the full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. They tried to block that way again. They tried to block that road again. What it is, they want the Jews to be that number one people. They want to set the standard. They want to set the mark. In other words, they want to tell you how you're supposed to live. Like us. Like me. You know, if we all live like each other, boy, we'd have a mess, wouldn't we? I look at you and you look at me and say, I don't want to live like him. And I look at you and say, I don't want to live like you. My goal in life is to live like Jesus. I want to live by his commandments. I want to live by his teachings. I want his heart in my heart. What's that going to do? That's going to make me more like him. And that's our goal. But what the Judaizers here were coming in and saying, we want the Gentile world to be Jewish. In other words, if you're going to be saved, you've got to be Jewish. You've got to follow all their laws, all their rules. Hebrews right there said it was by the blood of Christ. That salvation came. They wanted to put a yoke back on. They wanted to put a yoke back on. See, salvation brings liberty. Salvation brings liberty. And when you've got a yoke of bondage on you, there's no liberty in that. You go where the yoke says go. If you've ever hooked up a mew, anybody ever hooked up a mew? Y'all say, mm mm. June asked. When you hook him up and you put all his harness on, you get everything on him, you get that collar on him, and one of the last things you put on is a set of blinders. Those blinders, just like this right here, and that mule can't see side to side. No peripheral vision. All that mule can see is what's straight in front of it. When the devil gets a yoke of bondage on you, he holds that yoke of bondage just like that mule. He puts these blinders on you where you can't see side to side. All you can see is what's in front of you, and he wants to lead you in that direction and carry you in that direction without being able to see the grace of a holy God that's all the way around you. That's a yoke of bondage. That's what it'll do. And he says right here that we can't allow that to come back. we got to get that back on there. The Jew wanted that on the Gentile, but it wasn't going to happen. He wanted them back in the shadows. He didn't want their life to be a ray of sunshine. He didn't want them living in the light of Jesus Christ. If we can keep them in the shadows and we can keep them pushed back, then that salvation will come back to the Jews and not the Gentiles. They'll be on our terms. We want it on our terms. We're all like that, aren't we? We want, we want everything on our terms. Well, you know what? It always don't work that way, does it? Not in this life. Sometimes we've got to give in to the terms of others so that things can come back. We're controlling people sometimes. Anybody, anybody OCD in here? You got to have it just a certain way all the time. I see people, yeah, me. That's me. That's me. I got to be a certain way. 
I've got to eat the same thing the same time every day. My clothes have got to be a certain way the same time every day. You'd be in trouble at my house. The gospel of Jesus Christ gives you what you need, but he gives everybody what they need differently because we're all not the same. I've got needs in my life. The questions Jim were asking, was asking a while ago, I had needs in my life that are not your needs, but you know what? Jesus can meet my need. But you don't have to have your needs met on my terms. You have them on Jesus' terms. The Judaizers here are saying you've got to be on our terms. Their action completely denounced the work of Christ at Calvary. Their thought process here completely done away with what Jesus did at the cross of Calvary. Now they're arguing with Paul on this. This is a man who's already been stoned for the gospel. I've never been left for dead for the gospel. And they're wanting to argue with him. And if they were correct, listen to this, if they were correct, that missionary journey of grace that Paul had just come off of, everybody that Paul had come in contact with had not met Jesus. No salvation. So you know what Paul said? Hey, let's go to Jerusalem. I go before the church. I guarantee you, I stand before any council you want to put, and I'll tell you what I'm going to argue, the grace. I'm going to argue the grace. Church, we need to argue the grace today because there's salvation here this morning. There may be somebody here this morning, listen to me, and you may need to be saved today. You may need to come to know Christ as a personal Savior. Can I tell you something? It's not going to make you like everybody else here. It's going to make you yours in him. You're going to be who you are in Christ. Because the Bible teaches in Ephesians that it's grace through faith is where salvation comes from. So they go to Jerusalem. And I guarantee you the ones that were starting this little rumor, the ones that were starting this battle, the ones that wanted to fight this thing, the ones that were associated but not authorized, well, they're fixing to get way more than what they bargained for because they had no idea of the defense team that God had already lined up here that was fishing to speak for the gospel of Christ and not for the ways of man. Because I'm going to tell you something. When the gospel really gets a hold of you, the ways of man don't matter anymore. It's about what Jesus Christ wants you to do with your life. So as they move into Jerusalem, and they stand before the church there. Look at verse 6. Look at verse 6 to 18 with me. Excuse me. <clears throat> and the apostles and elders came together to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, oh, look here. Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and belief. And God which knoweth the hearts bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Look at what Peter did right there. Peter stands up and he says, I've heard enough. I've heard enough. This is Peter. Wait a minute. I, you know what I love about this? This is how you know that God can work in your life. This is that impulsive Peter. This is that Peter that stuck his foot in his mouth a thousand times to get to this place right here. This is Peter that denied Jesus as he was on the way to the cross of Calvary. This is Peter that drew his sword and cut that ear off in the garden and Jesus had to calm him down. This is Peter that let his flesh take over so many times but he sat patiently and he listened and he waited and when the time was right, he stood up and it was on. 
Can that, that's an example of what salvation can do in your life right there. That's where salvation can bring you out of that impulsive part of your life and you can wait on the things of God. But Peter stood up and when Peter rose up, he took a look back. See, what Peter done was look at the past. He said, let me tell you something. Look back at what God did. Who knew that I would preach? Who knew that my soul would be filled? With the Holy Ghost. And who knew that God had given me the king, the keys of the kingdom? See, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, he told Peter, he said, I give you the keys to the kingdom. And let me tell you what Peter did with it right here. He unlocked it. He began to unlock the kingdom. He began to open doors. He opened them first to the Jews. Acts chapter 2, when he became filled with the Holy Ghost, man, he began to preach. And it said 3,000 souls were added that day, man, as he just flat out preached right there. And he didn't do it through himself. He didn't do it through the law. He didn't do it through anything of him. He did it through the fullness of the grace of a holy God. But then in the 8th chapter of the book of Acts, he began to preach to the Samaritans. And what he did, he says he opened his mouth and boldly the gospel of Christ came out. And he preached salvation through grace. Not any law in there. But then he moved on to Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. He preached. What did he preach? Oh, you've got to be circumcised. You've got to come through here. And you've got to do it this way to be saved. No, he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ and the grace. And the Holy Ghost came in and did what saved them. Cornelius and his whole house was saved. Through the grace of a holy God. He said, y'all remember that? Y'all remember these things? God gave the spirit to the Gentiles. He says right there, he says, what did he give to them? He said, he gave the Holy Ghost to them. He said, he gave the Holy Ghost to them just as he did us. He gave them the Holy Ghost. If God wanted them to be saved under the law, he would have never even had to send the Holy Ghost. He just sent a false teacher through there to save them under the law. If they had not been saved, he never would have given the Spirit. Can I tell you something? You don't have the Spirit outside of salvation. You do not have the Holy Ghost living in you outside of salvation. Now, the Holy Ghost will come and speak to you. It's your will. But he don't live and rule your life outside of salvation. It's when you accept him, that's when you get that in your life. Thank God for it, because he has to lead me every day. He has to constrain me every day. He has to hold me every day. But what he did, see, through grace, God erased the difference. Grace erased the difference between a Jew and a Gentile, and it made them equal. Because can I tell you something? The Jew had grace just like the Gentile. Either could have it. See, God taught Peter. Remember right before he went to Cornelius' house, that it's not what goes into the body. It's about what grace can do in the body. But then Peter steps up and he says, man, why in the world would we want to put a yoke back on something that God's removed it from? God's removed that yoke. Why in the world do we want to put that yoke of the law back on? God's took it away through the, through the blood of Christ. Why would we want to put it back on? Church, can I tell you something? We're so guilty today. We continue to try to put that yoke back on. We continue to try to put that yoke back on. Let's let the yoke be gone. I love that song, He Set Me Free. Love that song. Because it says, once like a bird in prison I dwell. No freedom from the sorrow I felt. But listen to this. Then Jesus came and wait, he listened to me. And glory to God, he set me free. He removed that yoke of bondage when I cried mercy unto him and he gave it to me. Why in the world would we want to put it back on? Why would we want to snap it back down? Jesus said, Matthew chapter 11, verse 33, my yoke is easy and my burden's light. 
You might be sitting here this morning, listen to me. I want you to hear this. You might be sitting under a yoke of bondage today. His yoke is easy. His burden's light. You don't have to tote all that. He'll take it away from you. But as Peter sat and pled his case, man, he laid it out there. And I guarantee you, the whole church council, every, what the, every, where, every, how many was sitting there, but they're going. What just happened here? Wait a minute. Peter divides you. We know that. But all of a sudden, grace took over. And Peter, took, Peter, uh, Peter spoke truth. And the church is going. That's what happens today. When the truth comes out of somebody and begins to be proclaimed in the church, we all go, what just happened there? So there was Peter, that first line of defense right there. And he went to the past. Verse 12, look at this. Look at Paul and Barnabas. Look what they did. Then all the multitudes kept silent. Man, Peter does silence the crowd. Look. And gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Let me tell you what God had done on this journey that we were on. We presented the gospel. We taught salvation through Christ. And guess what? Thousands of people came to know Christ as a Savior. And this, that was just right, just right here not too long ago. Miracles and wonders. And he's still doing the same. On our way here, we stopped. And man, we saw people saved on our way to Jerusalem. That's right now. There's nothing any glorious in seeing someone saved by the grace of a holy God. And you've got to understand something, too. The book of Romans and the book of Galatians that preaches on this liberty in Christ and salvation, God, they weren't written yet. They didn't have them to go by. They had the word of these men. So Paul and Barnabas stood up and began to talk about what Christ is doing now. You see what happened in Peter's life. You see what Christ is doing right now with Paul and Barnabas. And then here comes one that nobody saw coming. Nobody saw this. This, this shut the church up. Y'all ever seen that happen in a church? All of a sudden, God got a hold of one that nobody saw it coming. And man, he just floored everybody. Look at the next verse. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Listen. Simeon hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take them out of people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. Look at verse 16. As this I return and will build again the tabernacle of David which is fallen down and I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doth all these things. Known unto God, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentences that we trouble not them from the among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication from all things strangled and from blood. For Moses of the old time hath in every city them they preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. All of a sudden, this James comes on the scene. And this is not James' brother John. Remember, he's already laid his life down. This is James' brother Jesus. The one that didn't even believe his, his own brother was the Messiah until after the resurrection. That's grace. After, he lived in the house with Jesus, but didn't realize he was the Messiah. Wouldn't believe it until after the resurrection. And now he pops up and he says, listen to me. You've heard from the past. You've heard from the present. We need to worry about what the future is going to take place because I'm going to tell you something about grace. I've been saved by it. Not only that, I'm not going to answer you in myself. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to answer you through the word of God right here. Because the answer he gave didn't come out of the mouth of man. The answer he gave came out of Amos chapter 9, verse 11 and 12. He said, this is what the word of God says about the future 
of the church, the future of Jesus Christ, the future of the lands, the future of heaven. This is what it says about it. He said, I'll take the remains and I'll take the residue of the Gentiles. And boy, you know he floored them when he says this in the, in the latter part of verse 14. He says, to take out them a people for his name. See, the Jews were a people for his name. That was their thing right there. We're the people of God. He said, hey, he visited the Gentiles first. Hey, he went to the Gentiles first. You see, salvation comes in this. Salvation comes through this. James knew what it meant. And he said, and what we have to do now, we've heard the past, we've heard the present, in the future. We've got to get something out to the Gentiles to let them know that they're saved through grace, but to give them something to live by. Give them something to live by that they can't live by the law of Moses. We don't even want to go there. We've got to give them something so that they can understand that there's rules in life and guidelines to live by. You know what? There's rules in God's word for the child of God to live by. There's rules right here for us to live by. Are we going to break those rules? Sure we are. Are we going to make mistakes and mess up? Sure we are. Thank God for grace. And we live under that grace. If we didn't, well, we'd be in a sure enough mess, wouldn't we? What if you had to live up to the law every day? You had to live by it, under it, through it every day. And at one time a year, on a day of atonement, you got to bring a sacrifice to make up for everything that you had done wrong in that past year. How many of us could even remember all the stuff we had done wrong in that past? None of us. Because you know what? We have a hard time remembering what we've done wrong yesterday. Let's just get it worse out. We have a hard time remembering what we've already done wrong this morning. You say, I ain't done nothing wrong this morning. If you got up, you've done something wrong. Amen. Amen. Oh, that's, is that just me? Is that everybody or just me? But you know what? Thank God for grace. Because I can come to him in repentance. I can ask forgiveness of my sins. And the Bible teaches in the book of Romans that's there now that the wages of sin are, is death, but salvation comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. And, you, and if you're here this morning, I want you to understand something. There's no law that you have to live up to. All you have to do is give in to the grace of a holy God to be saved. Let the Holy Ghost speak right into your heart and give in to the grace of a holy God to be saved. Because too many times today, listen, people say, well, I, I, sure, I sure would. I need to get saved, but boy, I can't live it. I need to get saved, but boy, I, I can't live it. You don't have to live it, okay? You get saved and let the Holy Ghost in you, the Holy Ghost will live it for you. He'll, let you, he'll tell you when you're wrong. He'll let you know when you're wrong. And all you got to do is ask forgiveness. Why? Because that veil is rent from the top to the bottom. You don't have to ask anybody to speak to God for you. You can speak to him yourself. Through his son, Jesus Christ. Who's sitting at the right hand of the Father right now making intercession for you. So if you're sitting here this morning and you say, Preacher, I, you know, Holy Ghost speaking to me. I know I need to be saved. Boy, I can't live up to that law. You don't have to. Peter just said that. You don't have to. Paul and Barnabas just said that. You don't have to. James said, let's write them some letters. Let's get them something out there to live by. You don't have to because the grace that saved these men is the same grace that can save you today. And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. Not the power of man. Not the power of me. Not the power of anything else but the power of a holy God. And listen, he wants everybody to be saved. He wants everybody here to be saved. Many of us sit here and will say, well, I know I'm saved. I only speak for myself. I can't speak for anybody sitting on these front rows. You hear what people say, well, they're sitting on the front row, they must be saved. They said I'm close to the front. They must be saved. Can I tell you something? Salvation isn't any greater on the front than it is on the back. 
is for everybody. Romans 1 16. For it is the power of salvation to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. There's no separation. The only thing that's separating you from salvation today is your choice. Is your choice to say, I need to be saved. You say, preacher, why did you preach all that? That's crazy this morning. I don't even understand nothing you're saying. Why did you do that? Because God told me to. God said do it. Because somebody needed to hear. Either somebody needed to understand a little bit more about grace or somebody needed to be saved. I don't know. But I do know this. The God that I serve, not only is he a loving God full of grace that wants to see his people saved, he's a jealous God that wants no idols in front of him. That's what James said. He said, let's tell them, don't put anything in front of him. Don't live in front of him. I want you to understand something. Don't live in front of God. Live for God. Live for him. Do y'all believe there's a world out there that needs salvation? Amen. Amen. Do y'all believe if salvation was to sweep through our government right now, it didn't make all the difference in the world? Amen. Do you believe if salvation would begin to sweep through the churches right now and people would understand that I, I, I got to give in to the Holy Ghost to be saved, do you believe it can make a difference in a life? Amen. It could. And when a few lives are changed, then the world begins to be changed. We all sit and say, well, it's got to start all the way on this big place over here, this big place over here. It might start this little place right here. But we got to be obedient to say, here I am. God, use me. Maybe sitting here this morning and that Lord's speaking to you. All you got to do is say, here I am, God. The first step of salvation is the hardest step. That first step out in that aisle, that first step towards the, the foot of the cross, that's the hardest step to make. After that, it's simple. Because you'll never remember. You'll never remember that walk. All you will remember is I went down and I cried mercy and I came up changed. That's what you're going to That Roman road to salvation, they didn't have it, but we do. We do. And we're all sinners. We all come short of the glory of God. But anybody willing to call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says, shall be saved. So this morning, as the Holy Spirit works, listen, you may know somebody that needs to be saved. As a child of God, it's your duty to pray for them. You may be here this morning and, man, you say, well, I didn't really understand why I was coming here today, but now I understand, and I need to be saved. I need to take a step. I need to move out. All you got to do is take one step. God will do the rest. God will do the rest. So as they stand with us this morning, as they come with a song. 238. Be obedient this morning. Listen, you might need to just come thank him a little bit this morning. I don't know. I don't know what needs are. You've got, you know what your needs are. But I do know this. We've already sang it. Jesus cares. And he cares for you and about you this morning. So as we sing this morning, you be obedient to the Spirit.
Savior this morning. 